Greetings, fellow freethinkers. The event you're about to watch was hosted by the Center for Inquiry Ontario, an educational and outreach organization dedicated to promoting and defending science, reason, and free inquiry in every area of human endeavor. My name is Justin Trazier, and as Executive Director of CFI Ontario, I would like to take a minute to tell you about us. Our center, located in the heart of downtown Toronto, is the first Canadian branch of CFI and is our nation's first dedicated meeting and event space for humanists and free thinkers. Our mandate encompasses a robust public education presentation series throughout Ontario, campus outreach as we support a growing network of student free thought groups, community outreach and social services to provide humanistic alternatives to religiously monopolized services and activities, and a lending library and media center that, among other things, broadcasts videos like this across the planet. To learn more, please visit us at cfiontario.org. To get on our email list or to learn how you can support our movement or get a free thought group started at your campus, simply contact us today at info at cfiontario.org. Thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy the video. CFI for that. A um, few quick announcements and then I'll introduce our esteemed speaker. Um, we have a lot of new stuff that we wanted to let you know about. We have a new library, which I can point to. Books aren't all sorted, but we got a very generous donation of a few thousand books, so in the next uh, week or two you'll be seeing more and more books. Um, and we'll have an online search engine for you to peruse if you want to borrow. They're all available publicly. Um, we also have a new newsletter. Our, uh, I guess the June newsletter will expire in about a week, so our August, July and August newsletter is out on the tables uh, outside and on, the, on that table in the center there. So please do pick that up on your way out. That will tell you what's uh, happening at CFI in the next couple of months. We have a lot of upcoming events. We have a midsummer party on August 8th. It's 888, you don't know, so it's a big deal for some reason. Um, so I encourage you to, uh, to attend that. Uh, we also have a new community. I may have mentioned to you that we've launched a community in Calgary. Well, I can now say we're launching one in Montreal. We got a nice donation, so we're moving forward with that. We're also hiring a part-time permanent staff person here uh, at CFI Ontario. So that's kind of the first public announcement for that. You'll get more correspondence. If you do know anybody, we, are, uh, we will be actively looking um, for a candidate in the next month or so. so just something to put out there. And I should introduce John Zhu, who um, is at the back waving. Uh, kind of awkwardly, and John is our new intern here, so he'll be assisting us over the next few months. Um, John is a great guy. If you have any questions about um, becoming a volunteer here at sort of administrative stuff, uh, please uh, refer you to John. Um, last thing I wanted to say after turning my cell phone off is that uh, as always we encourage you to, to join CFI, become what we call a friend of the center, a CFI member. Uh, lots of incentives for doing that, coming to events, for example, like these for free. Uh, coming to our catered reception, uh, which we had before this event. We do this on a monthly basis uh, for the big events. Um, so I encourage you to take advantage of that. Also books for sale and stuff like that. Uh, Greta's book tonight will have a special members discount for those of you who are interested, um, and a special new members extra discount for those of you who we can entice to become new members. Um, I will stop talking now, except to introduce our speaker, Greta Vosper, and we can get to the, uh, the real reason you're all here. Greta Vosper is United Church Minister at West Hill United Church in Toronto, and she's founder and chair of the Canadian Centre for Progressive Christianity. Uh, with Greta, the Centre for Inquiry and other allies were involved in the One School System Network, how you may have, have heard of the Centre for Progressive Christianity, uh, and they were a, a great ally uh, to have in this fight for, for secularism uh, within the faith community, so we really appreciate their support on that. Greta is also the new author of a book called With or Without God, why the way we live is more important than what we believe, which is a fascinating read. I encourage you to, uh, to purchase her book um, after the event is complete. And uh, just to summarize what she'll be talking about, um, just to pull some words from lots and lots of the press attention that, that Greta's been getting, 
uh, if, some of the press went something like this. In Greta's church, there are no prayers, no miracle performing magic Jesus, and no omnipotent God at all, which was quite a stunning thing to, to read. So I do encourage you to, to, uh, to take this message uh, very much to heart. A uh, real ally for the secular humanist community, I believe. I'm going to uh, let Greta take it from here, and uh, we'll take your questions at the end. Thanks. So thank you very much for that, Justin. Uh, I'll put these lights down a little later. I'm not going to actually get to that until later on uh, when I'm speaking. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here uh, this evening. This is a very interesting group for me to be standing in front of. Generally, when I'm speaking about my book and the work that I do, I'm speaking to a predominantly Christian audience, uh, some of whom are relieved that I'm finally uh, saying the things that I'm saying within the church, and some of whom are really ticked off that I am saying the things that I am saying, and I'm still being allowed to stay in the church. So it'll be a very interesting uh, conversation that we have at the end of... Uh, is, that, is that better? Okay. If I lick it, will you hear that? <laughs> uh, anyway, so, um, so it's, I'm really looking forward to that final part of the evening when we do engage and when I get to find out what your interests and concerns are. Uh, each group that I speak with ha comes from a different kind of perspective and that's when we can sort of fill out some of those questions. And some of, the, uh, some of my best thinking has happened when I've had to respond to a question that someone has raised that I've never considered before. So please do feel free to ask um, questions and we can engage on that. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer which is probably how all of this began. But before I get there, I do want to thank Justin uh, for inviting me to be here and uh, for introducing me to the Center for Inquiry. Uh, he connected with me after I had written a letter to the editor about uh, the One School System, not about One School System Network, about that ridiculous idea um, to uh, have faith-based schools here in Ontario. Uh, and so he responded to me and we connected and uh, realized that much of the ground upon which we we are each walking is uh, is very similar, and I've never heard anyone who has the same cell phone ring as I have. So <laughs> there you go. So uh, anyway, so it's wonderful to be here, and I'm really really pleased uh, to be able to talk with you. But that uh, question that I referred to a moment ago, that uh, questions that I don't have an answer for, that's probably the thin edge of the wedge as to where I got to. It was my ability, my desire, my uh, want to say I don't know to many of those questions that most people in my profession uh, have very ready answers for. Uh, I began um, my sort of movement into the church. I grew up in the church, obviously, graduated out of the church when I was confirmed at the age of 12 or 13, and that meant that you know, once you joined the church, it meant you could go down and take care of the kids in the nursery and you never had to go to Sunday school again. Mm -hmm. And it was a great relief for me because I, I was really having difficulty with all the things that I had just said I believed in order to become this member as my parents had wanted me to do. Uh, the minister at that church when I was growing up who engaged us in that program uh, was scared to death of some of those questions that people my age at that time, about 12 or 13, and you know them, uh, they've asked you questions. Uh, were asking him, and he didn't have the answers for them either. But he came up with something that sort of got us through that process, and then I graduated, as I said, out of uh, the Sunday school program and could really do whatever I wanted to. When I got to grade nine, uh, I took, as many of you probably did, a course in English uh, which looked at the myths of the Greek and Roman gods. And I went home and I told my mother that I had finally found what I believed in. I believed in the Greek and Roman gods because it seemed to make sense to me to have one for every little aspect of my life, you know, instead of this one sort of amorphous thing that, you know, really never had much connection with me. So my mother was furious and told me that until I was 16, I had to believe in the God that she believed in. So, right. so, but by the time I was 17, I was away at university and for some completely unknown reason felt that I wanted to reconnect with the church. And so I began going to a church in Sackville, New Brunswick. I went to Mount Allison University. And uh, while there, um, I had sort of had this idea that I wanted to go into ministry. No idea why, except that I really respected the very intellectual uh, minister, not the one who was teaching confirmation classes at my church. I admired him. 
He was brilliant, he was articulate, he was passionate, um, and, I, and I really admired the work that he was doing. So I had this idea that maybe I would do that. Um, so I went back to this church and, and uh, reconnected with church, and within about six months had really decided that I could not actually do that, um, that if I did that, I would go crazy. So I moved away from that idea for about 10 years. I actually had said to my uh, folks, who were sort of thinking this was kind of a cool idea, that I couldn't actually uh, become a leader in the church because the church wasn't ready for me. But in actual fact, I wasn't ready for the church at that point in time. I was 18 years old. I had, you know, one of those uh, white bread middle class upbringings. I had never experienced anything that was anything of a, of a moral challenge, uh, any kind of difficulty in my personal life. Uh, I was pretty scrubbed clean, and it, it was a very good idea that I did not actually go into a process uh, that, was, that would form me for ministry at that point in time. Ten years later, uh, when I enrolled in the Theological College at Queen's, I had enough living under my belt that I could uh, actually come to understand a lot of what people who come into community, into spiritual community, arrive at the door for, why they come in, what they've experienced in their lives, and I was much more ready for that role at that time. The book that I've written contains in it pretty much what I was taught at Theological College, and I'm not sure if that comes as a surprise to you or not, but while I was at Theological College, uh, I arrived because I had questions, not because I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to get answers for those questions, uh, those big questions about the meaning of life, about how the world came to be, about how the cosmos functions and what my place in it is. Uh, scanning it, my place was pretty puny, and the idea that it was that puny was a frightening thought. So I needed to connect with a larger story, with one that would help me understand what that little tiny dot that was me was doing in that vast cosmos. And while there, I was exposed to a lot about Christianity that I had never heard anywhere else. Because I came sort of with this clean slate of someone who had at one point toyed with the idea of believing in the Greek gods, I didn't, the idea of my worldview being uh, torn to pieces uh, wasn't, it wasn't a problem for me. For some of my fellow students who arrived with a scrubbed clean uh, Christian worldview, entering theological college is a very shattering experience. Because there, uh, the things that you learn are that your faith is pretty much a human construction. So if you've been taught otherwise, it's a very difficult thing to swallow. In the theological college in my first year, I had to study uh, church history. The book that, I, that we were given as our text for that course was Elaine Pagel's The Gnostic Gospels. I don't know if you know that book, but uh, Elaine Pagels looks at, in, at that time, that was 1987, and uh, the Nag Hammadi texts, which had been found, were, had not yet been released to the public. They were still being very protected by the scholars, mostly Roman Catholic, who had control of them. And her uh, book was about that conspiracy, about the Gospels that had been in existence uh, in the first century of uh, Christianity. The, and, and the communities for which those uh, Gospels had been written, and the whole process that the Church had gone through to put together these four, and how many, Gospels into the canon, the purpose for laying them out in the particular order they were, and the, and the struggles that took place between, uh, within the Church, between those who were seeking to be its leaders over the course of that first couple of centuries, maybe on into the third and fourth century. It was a, a, an iconoclastic look at the church. If you thought the church was the bride of Christ, you were really in trouble. Because it was not the bride of Christ. It had not been uh, created by a divine hand. It had actually, within it, all the faults, all those uh, places that it could crumble, that come to anything that is created by human uh, hands and human minds, that are created out of a sense of uh, power, uh, and, the, and the search quest for power uh, within an, the formation of an early uh, organization. So that was just my church history book. Uh, when it came to studying um, the Bible, uh, I was exposed to all kinds of uh, tools 
to take it apart piece by piece, to look at the communities that it had been written for, each different part, to, to find, found out that all those prophecies that were uh, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures that came true in the, in the Christian scriptures had actually been written in there long after, you know, like the whole idea that Isaiah had prophesied something. Well, you know, if you've got 60 or 80 years to write a story out, you can go back and look at what the prophecies are and write them right into the story. And that is something that people to this day still have a very hard time believing, which I have a hard time believing too. But we learned that the Bible had been written, each and every part of it, by whatever hand wrote it, had been written for a specific purpose, for a specific people, and that it was to try to, as best they could, if I'm going to give them a lot of positive credit, the best that they could to struggle with the meaning of life and what it was for them at that point in time. And they used sometimes the best of human uh, enterprise to bring those stories together, and sometimes they used the worst of human enterprise to bring those stories together. And we will never know the full story of how that was put together. So that was my study of the scriptures. I remember my professor uh, for New Testament studies was a, a rabbi here from Toronto who would drive down to Queens to, to teach us our course. And, and he said to us before he opened his mouth the first day, or I guess he had to open his mouth to say it, but before he started teaching us, he said, you are studying for ministry here. And so it doesn't matter what you discover in this course. You are going to have to go back to these books and hold them as scripture. They are your holy scriptures. So he was warning us gently that while we were going to discover the human fingerprints on all these books, on all these stories, somehow we were going to have to work that into our being, into our ministry, and hold them as something that was sacred. A very, very difficult task. And I think he knew how difficult that task was going to be. We also, while, I, while you're preparing for the ministry, you go through this whole process of uh, the practice of ministry, and you have to practice at it because it's not easy. Uh, but the practice of ministry included the understanding of worship and how to lead worship. And that was a very uh, different sort of thing than what I had been exposed to in, in the remnants of uh, Methodism, which had been uh, within the congregation I had grown up. And I speak of this in my book as the severing of the corpus callosum. Because all that information that I uh, filled my left brain with about the history of the church, about the human construction of uh, the Bible, of Christianity, of all religion, about um, the, the evolution of the theology of this wondrous story of God, that just filled this half of my brain incredibly. And I was intrigued and engaged and excited about everything that I learned there. I was like lapping it up as I find usually when people are introduced to this kind of information, they tend to do. But that practice of ministry thing was happening on the other side of my brain, on the right side of my brain, that more creative side where uh, language isn't really the most important thing, but the other senses uh, become uh, more integral to the experience. And that was where my understanding, we were being taught how to preside in worship. It was a stretch because Worship had always been about the word for me. It had always been, you know, a, a preacher that was uh, highly intellectual, very astute, very uh, eager to get his point across using words and nothing but words. But I was learning while at theological college that there was this whole kind of sacramental kind of thing happening where you could introduce colors and candles and dance and music and liturgical garments, and uh, I have learned recently smoke machines, in order to actually bring people into a sense of the sacred. It became, it was taught as an art form. And so I, who had been starved of any art forms in my uh, religious upbringing, thought this was pretty cool, that we could engage in you know, sensual experiences of God was new and inviting and exciting. And so I and my colleagues, you know, came up with these, you know, wildly creative uh, worship services. Uh, I would sing in them, if you can believe that. Uh, we would do all kinds of ribbons, everything. It was an amazing time there, that very, very rich, sensual uh, time to develop worship in. 
But in order to function once I got out of that place, I had to actually sever those two lobes. Because everything that was happening over here, all this sensual stuff, was built, it was predicated upon what happened in the early church and in the medieval church, all of those uh, symbols and ideas and art and understanding that had grown out of that belief that the Bible was the authoritative word of God for all time, which this half of my brain had been taught it was not. And so in order to create worship experiences, I had to rely entirely on that creative part of my brain. And then for that 10 or 15 minutes I could squeeze into the sermon, I'd pull on this stuff. I'd contextualize the scriptures, I'd talk about you know, the community that they were written for, I'd talk about the socioeconomic situations that were there, the political influences, I'd talk about when it was written instead of when it was supposedly written. I'd put all that stuff <coughs> on the table, and then when, if there was anything left at the end, I'd pull in you know, maybe a little contemporary uh, connection so that it would have some meaning for people. But it all happened in this very eclipsed part of uh, the service. The rest of it was still this holy, divine mystery space which was great, worked for me. And it worked for a lot of people in my congregation too. But there came a point in time when, because of some circumstances that happened uh, in the presbytery uh, that I was a member of, and that's the overseeing body of the churches that we're in. Uh, I went with another member of the clergy uh, to each congregation. We just took a workshop around to get to know people, to try to bridge some of those, some, um, heal some relationships that had been broken. And uh, in the course of doing that, which took two years, um, we had conversations with people about what their values and what their beliefs were. And we found out that their values were incredible. They, we used this little uh, workshop to get to what their core values were. And we found that they were always about uh, radically ethical living, about justice, about compassion, about loving uh, in ways that brought about justice and compassion. So we were very impressed with what the values were. But the beliefs, when we found out what their beliefs were, we were kind of stunned. Because unless someone had actually been theologically educated as we had been, or had participated in some level of the church that was higher than just a congregation, in the presbytery or the conference or the general council levels, which are all different uh, levels of uh, church work in the United Church of Canada, their understandings of God were elementary. They believed that when people died, God would take them to heaven uh, and often would explain that that happened. Uh, if they had to explain that to a child, they'd use the, the picture of God needing helpers in heaven or taking the most beautiful people to heaven. Uh, they'd speak about people going to sleep and God coming to rescue them to be with him. Their understandings of the virgin birth were literal. Uh, their understandings of Jesus, they could talk about Jesus as a savior, but they had no idea what they were being saved from. Uh, and their understanding of the resurrection was always uh, literal as well. A bodily resurrection that had happened in three days, which proved that they hadn't read the Bible at all. But so, so we looked at each other and went, where did you go to school? And he told me where he went to school, and I told him where I went to school, and we found out that both of us, knew the Bible was not the divine word of God. And both of us didn't really believe in a you know, bodily resurrection. And both of us had sort of like non-theistic, amorphous understandings of God as you know that whatever it is that makes me live in right relationship, not, certainly not a being. So we looked at each other and said, well, how did these people get like these crazy ideas? You know, we who were leading them, obviously, who had been trained. We had been taught very different things from what we were hearing back from those people who sat in front of us each Sunday morning. So he went on to uh, create a, an adult study curriculum to help uh, bring people into a uh, relationship with contemporary liberal scholarship and, and to engage that. And I went back to my congregation and went, what the hell is going on here? I could not figure out how my congregation bright as they were, were somehow stuck, just like all the other ones, in these very simplistic understandings of faith, very elementary understandings. So I had to go and take a look at uh, what I was doing as a leader in that congregation. And initially, I, when I first went to the board with my uh, shock and concern about this, I spoke to them about um, 
I spoke to them about a spiritual crisis. I named it as a spiritual crisis, but I realized later that it wasn't about my beliefs. It wasn't about the, the, the shattering of my worldview. It was about my questioning how I was to lead a community of faith uh, who weren't getting it as far as I was concerned. So I went back and started looking at my community of faith. And, you know, I'd been preaching in a very critical, deconstructionist kind of mode. Uh, spending most of the time that I was preaching taking the scriptures apart, very little time actually putting anything of any spiritual substance in front of people. It was all very, you know, rationally uh, good, solid, nothing wrong with that. But then I looked at the rest of the service. And it didn't take me but a moment to realize that everything I wrapped, whatever I sat in, had all that stuff in it. It talked about... God is the creator of the universe. Uh, we sang about Jesus saving us from our sins. We sang about taking the light of Jesus to the nations. Uh, we uh, had little plays about uh, Jesus being born in a manger with a star that we twirled up at the top above it. We reinforced at almost every opportunity those pre-Copernican ideas, those irrational understandings, those ideas of God that I had long ago left back in grade nine. And we had not challenged the people in our pews to think their way forward from about the fourth century uh, of Christianity. So the question was, what do we do now? No, we can't, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep uh, you picking these hymns. I can't keep leading prayers as though something's actually going to happen. I can't uh, keep a, a worldview in place for these people that, however comfortable it is, I didn't believe in. So it was, I was misrepresenting myself by consistently placing before them those things that I didn't believe. Now, get the microphone up. Okay, uh, microphone up. Sorry. So the so what happened was I needed to go back and look at all of those things and, and challenge myself and 